This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chekris, London, UK. The Idle Thoughts of an Idle Fellow by Jerome K. Jerome. Section 14 On Memory. I remember, I remember, in the days of chill November, how the blackbird on the... I forget the rest. It is the beginning of the first piece of poetry I ever learned, for Hey Diddle Diddle, the Cat and the Fiddle, I take no note of, it being of a frivolous character and lacking in the qualities of true poetry. I collected fourpence by the recital of I Remember, I Remember, I knew it was fourpence because they told me that if I kept it until I got twopence more, I should have sixpence, which argument, albeit undeniable, moved me not, and the money was squandered, to the best of my recollection, on the very next morning, although upon what, memory is a blank. That is just the way with memory. Nothing that she brings to us is complete. She is a willful child. All her toys are broken. I remember tumbling into a huge dust-hole when a very small boy, but I have not the faintest recollection of ever getting out again, and if memory were all we had to trust to, I should be compelled to believe I was there still. At another time, some years later, I was assisting at an exceedingly interesting love scene, but the only thing about it I can call to mind distinctly is that at the most critical moment somebody suddenly opened the door and said, Emily, you're wanted, in a sepulchral tone that gave one the idea the police had come for her. All the tender words she said to me, and all the beautiful things I said to her, are utterly forgotten. Life altogether is but a crumbling ruin when we turn to look behind. A shattered column here, where a massive portal stood, the broken shaft of a window to mark my lady's bower, and a mouldering heap of blackened stones where the glowing flames once leaped, and over all the tinted lichen and the ivy clinging green. For everything looms pleasant through the softening haze of time. Even the sadness that is past seems sweet. Our boyish days look very merry to us now, all nutting, hoop and gingerbread. The snubbings and toothaches and the Latin verbs are all forgotten, the Latin verbs especially, and we fancy we were very happy when we were hobbledehoys and loved, and we wish that we could love again. We never think of the heartaches, or the sleepless nights, or the hot dryness of our throats, when she said she could never be anything to us but a sister, as if any man wanted more sisters. Yes, it is the brightness, not the darkness, that we see when we look back. The sunshine casts no shadows on the past. The road that we have traversed stretches very fair behind us. We see not the sharp stones. We dwell but on the roses by the wayside, and the strong briars that stung us are, to our distant eyes, but gentle tendrils waving in the wind. God be thanked that it is so, that the ever-lengthening chain of memory has only pleasant links, and that the bitterness and sorrow of to-day are smiled at on the morrow. It seems as though the brightest side of everything were also its highest and best, so that as our little lives sink back behind us into the dark sea of forgetfulness, all that which is the lightest and the most gladsome is the last to sink, and stands above the waters long in sight when the angry thoughts and smarting pain are buried deep below the waves and trouble us no more. It is this glamour of the past, I suppose, that makes old folk talk so much nonsense about the days when they were young. The world appears to have been a very superior sort of place then, and things were more like what they ought to be. Boys were boys then, and girls were very different. Also, winters were something like winters, and summers not at all the wretched things we get put off with nowadays. As for the wonderful deeds people did in those times, and the extraordinary events that happened, it takes three strong men to believe half of them. 
I like to hear one of the old boys telling all about it to a party of youngsters who he knows cannot contradict him. It is odd if, after a while, he doesn't swear that the moon shone every night when he was a boy, and that tossing mad bulls in a blanket was the favourite sport at his school. It always has been, and always will be, the same. The old folk of our grandfather's young days sang a song bearing exactly the same burden, and the young folk of today will drone out precisely similar nonsense for the aggravation of the next generation. Oh, give me back the good old days of fifty years ago, has been the cry ever since Adam's fifty-first birthday. Take up the literature of 1835, and you will find the poets and novelists asking for the same impossible gift as did the German Minnesingers long before them, and the old Norse saga writers long before that. And for the same thing sighed the early prophets and the philosophers of ancient Greece. From all accounts, the world has been getting worse and worse ever since it was created. All I can say is that it must have been a remarkably delightful place when it was first opened to the public, for it is very pleasant even now, if you only keep as much as possible in the sunshine and take the rain good-temperedly. Yes, there is no gainsaying but that it must have been somewhat sweeter in that dewy morning of creation, when it was young and fresh when the feet of the tramping millions had not trodden its grass to dust, nor the din of the myriad cities chased the silence forever away. Life must have been noble and solemn to those free-footed, loose-robed fathers of the human race, walking hand in hand with God under the great sky. They lived in sun-kissed tents amid the lowing herds. They took their simple wants from the loving hand of nature, they toiled and talked and thought, and the great earth rolled round in stillness, not yet laden with trouble and wrong. Those days are past now. The quiet childhood of humanity, spent in the far-off forest glades and by the murmuring rivers, is gone forever, and human life is deepening down to manhood amid tumult, doubt, and hope. Its age of restful peace is past. It has its work to finish, and must hasten on. What that work may be, what this world's share is in the great design, we know not, though our unconscious hands are helping to accomplish it. Like the tiny coral insect, working deep under the dark waters, we strive and struggle each for our own little ends, nor dream of the vast fabric we are building up for God. Let us have done with vain regrets and longings for the days that never will be ours again. Our work lies in front, not behind us, and forward is our motto. Let us not sit with folded hands, gazing upon the past as if it were the building. It is but the foundation. Let us not waste heart and life thinking of what might have been, and forgetting the maybe that lies before us. Opportunities flit by while we sit regretting the chances we have lost, and the happiness that comes to us we heed not because of the happiness that is gone. Years ago, when I used to wander of an evening from the fireside to the pleasant land of fairy tales, I met a doughty knight and true. Many dangers had he overcome, in many lands had been, and all men knew him for a brave and well-tried knight, and one that knew not fear, except maybe upon such seasons when even